Hello everyone, RJM3 here. Welcome to a very special mini-series, a passion project, one I've been working on for quite some time. There was once a man, a soldier, so caught up in his own delusions, he continued to fight a war decades after it ended. Born as the third oldest of seven siblings, Second Lieutenant Hiro Onoda was 20 years old when he was drafted into the Imperial Japanese Army in May 1942. On December 26, 1944, Onoda was deployed to Lubang Island in the Philippines to help sabotage the island's airstrips and landing docks to hinder the imminent joint American-Filipino invasion. Upon his arrival, however, the local commanders prevented him and his squad from carrying out his orders, instead directing them to assist in evacuation efforts. When U.S. and Filipino forces landed on Lubang Island on February 28, 1945, as the last of the Japanese forces were fleeing the island, a notice commanding officer ordered him and three other men to stay behind and hindered the Allied invasion for as long as possible, promising that they would eventually come back for them. Anoda assumed leadership of the group and began to wage a guerrilla war in the jungles of Lubang Island. When Japan surrendered later that year, the U.S. dropped leaflets across the Pacific directed to all Japanese holdouts, informing them that the war was over. Anoda, however, suspected the leaflets were nothing more than American propaganda meant to trick them into surrendering, so his group continued fighting for years and years. As the decades dragged on, one by one, the men in Anoda's platoon either decided to surrender or were killed in skirmishes with the locals, until it was just Anoda. On February 20th, 1974, Japanese explorer and adventurer Norio Suzuki found Anoda and was able to convince him that the war was truly over. However, Anoda still refused to surrender on principle and agreed to only do so if given the order of a superior officer. Suzuki quickly informed the authorities of his encounter. The Japanese government tracked down Onoda's old superior, who had since retired from the military and became a bookseller, and sent him to Lubang Island to relieve Onoda of his duties. On March 9, 1974, Lieutenant Onoda finally surrendered. Onoda would never face any legal consequences for his actions on Lubang Island, on the basis that he genuinely believed he was still at war. Upon returning to Japan, Anoda was finally reunited with his elderly parents and his many siblings, but was distraught to find that his country had drifted so far from what he saw as its traditional values. So much so, that he sent himself to Brazil. There, he would live a relatively normal life as a cattle farmer. Anoda would end up bouncing between living in Japan and Brazil for the rest of his life. On January 16th, 2014, Hiro Onoda died of heart failure at St. Luke's International Hospital in Tokyo at the age of 91. Now, when I first heard the story of Lieutenant Onoda and how he genuinely believed that the Second World War was still going on for the entire time he was in the jungle, the alternate history gears in my brain started to turn. I began to wonder, what if Lieutenant Onoda was right? What if World War II continued to be fought for decades up until 1974? Is this a plausible scenario? Of course not. Prolonging World War II to just the early 50s is a stretch, let alone making it last until the mid-70s. This scenario certainly isn't helped by the fact that by the time Anoda and his platoon went into hiding, Japan's surrender was just six months away, and Germany's surrender was just two months away. But that's not the point. Instead, today, I wish to tell you all a story. This is not a story about plausibility. It is about insanity. Tragedy evil. So join me on this three-part journey where we explore what if World War II lasted until 1974. Why not? After all, what's the worst that can happen? Warning, the following alternate history scenario contains multiple narrations of graphic content. This video is not meant for younger audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. March 1st, 1945, 
5.30 a.m. local time. It has been almost two weeks since U.S. Marines have landed on the Japanese island stronghold of Iwo Jima. The Japanese have fiercely defended the island since the battle began. Just less than a week prior, the southern half of the island had been liberated and the American flag was iconically flown over Mount Suribachi. But the northern half of the island still remained under the control of the thoroughly entrenched Japanese. The battle is supposed to continue for another 25 days, but not this time around. In the early pre-dawn hours, the Japanese forces, the fanatic warriors and defenders of the Emperor, have stopped fighting. A sudden and inexplicable silence fell over the Japanese lines. Some of the Marines across the island courageously and cautiously approached the Japanese positions to investigate, half expecting an ambush or some sort of elaborate trap. But to their shock, every last Japanese soldier on the island has committed seppuku, from the lowest private to the highest ranking officer. All that's left is a field radio, now broadcasting static. Though disturbed, the U.S. forces on the island are relieved with this development. Iwo Jima is now liberated, and the immediate danger is over. One young Marine takes a moment to rest, sitting at the base of a palm tree near the beach. He reflects on his close encounter with death, reminisces about life before the war, and dreams of what life will be like after it ends. Returning home, seeing his family again, finally proposing to that girl he likes, settling down, having kids of his own. Perhaps in another world, he would have lived to see this dream through, but not in this one. Just as he is watching the sun rise in the east, a second sun comes from above and engulfs the whole island. On that day, several second suns would vaporize allied armies across the globe, and the world will never be the same. March 2nd, 1945, German Chancellor Adolf Hitler and Japanese Prime Minister Kuniaki Koiso go on the airwaves and announce to the world that Germany and Japan have both developed a new superweapon that could wipe cities off the map, the atomic bomb. A total of 18 atomic bombs had been dropped the day before, six bombs in Western Europe, six bombs in Eastern Europe, and six bombs in the Pacific. The targeted locations include London, Paris, Moscow, Leningrad, Manila, and of course, Iwo Jima. Most of the bombs were dropped on locations where large allied army groups and naval fleets were gathered. Among the dead include American generals Dwight D. Eisenhower, George Marshall, Douglas MacArthur, and Omar Bradley, British Field Marshals Bernard Montgomery and Alan Brooke, British Air Chief Marshal Arthur Harris, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, most of his cabinet, and most of parliament. French Army Generals Charles de Gaulle and John de Lettre de Tessigny, Soviet Marshals Georgi Zhukov, Alexander Vasilevsky, and Konstantin Rokossovsky, Soviet General Secretary Joseph Stalin, and most of the Politburo. In the closing statement of each of the radio announcements given by Hitler and Koiso, both demand the immediate and unconditional surrender of the Allied powers, or else they shall suffer nuclear annihilation. The devastating nuclear attack and the following radio messages sent terror and panic across the Allied nations, for a weapon now existed that could wipe away their lives and everyone they know and love in an instant at any time. This development hits U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt particularly hard, as his health has already deteriorated significantly by this point, and so he simply passes away. Vice President Harry S. Truman is sworn in as his successor a month ahead of schedule. Upon ascending to the presidency, Truman is informed of the Manhattan Project and that the U.S. could have its own atomic weapons in a matter of months. In Britain, the loss of most of the government and the charismatic leadership of Churchill in particular would have left a serious blow to morale. Leader of the House of Commons, Anthony Eden, fortunately not in London at the time of the bombing, succeeds Churchill as Prime Minister. He is left in the unenviable position of leading Britain through an even darker hour than the one it faced in 1940. In the USSR, head of the NKVD and Deputy Premier Lavrentiy Beria seizes power over the country following the death of Stalin. Perhaps the only man in the Soviet Union more sadistic than Stalin himself, Beria ruthlessly snuffs out any opposition and consolidates his control over the Union. In a secret meeting between the three new leaders, using the knowledge of the Manhattan Project nearing its completion, the assumption that the Axis has used up all their A-bombs in their stockpile and that it would be a while before the Axis was capable of another nuclear attack, 
Truman, Eden, and Beria decide to defiantly refute Hitler and Koiso's ultimatum, and vow to continue the fight until total victory has been achieved. The gambit that the Axis had no more atomic weapons ultimately paid off, as Germany and Japan never follow through with their threat of Armageddon. Unfortunately, calling out the Axis's bluff didn't stop the Germans and Japanese from going back on the offensive in Europe and the Pacific nearly unopposed. In Eastern Europe, the Nazis pushed back into Poland, Hungary, and Yugoslavia against the scattered Red Army. With de Gaulle and de Tessigny dead, Free France was left leaderless, and too few Allied armies left in Western Europe made it effectively defenseless. By the summer, the Nazis have nearly pushed the Soviets back to their 1938 border. The Balkans have been mostly reconquered, Rome has been recaptured, and the Allies have been driven out of the Low Countries and Northern France. Japan has retained control of Okinawa and taken back control of Guam and the irradiated remains of Iwo Jima and Saipan. It is an average Tuesday morning, the rising sun shining brightly over the tropical town along the beach. A middle-aged man emerges, fishnet and fishing rod in hand, from a small house facing the ocean, followed by his daughter carrying another fishing rod. Her name is Maria, and it is her 13th birthday, though for her, there will be no party or cake today, only work. Her father is a fishmonger, and he always needs her help to catch as many fish as possible in order to provide for the both of them. They are the only family they have. Maria's mother had died in childbirth. She could have gotten better treatment that could have possibly saved her life, if not for the great war that had consumed the world and dwindled its resources. The year is 1973. Though the fighting had been going on for so long, their little slice of the world that they called home had thankfully not been ravaged by any actual military engagements for decades. For the most part, Maria's hometown knew peace except for the stories and rumors of what lurks in the foliage, terrorizes their homes, stalks townsfolk, and makes them disappear. A monster, as she understood. This is why her father remains armed at all times, with a 9mm pistol stuck in the waistband of his shorts and hidden under his t-shirt. Maria and her father walk to the nearby riverbank where their small boat is tied up. They load their equipment and then themselves aboard. Maria's father revs up the motor, and the boat speeds upstream towards his favorite fishing spot. It is an average Tuesday, for now. Though, as Maria and her father move deeper inland into the untamed wilderness, they have no idea of the horrors they are about to experience. July 18th, 1945. The scientists of the Los Alamos National Laboratory are almost finished with the assembly of the first ever American atomic bomb in a ranch house just 80 miles northwest of Alamo Gordo, New Mexico. Its detonation test in just a few hours, codenamed Trinity. There are already plans in place to bomb Berlin and Tokyo if the test is successful, delivering a decapitation strike on the Axis, hopefully bringing the war to a swift end. Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer the head scientist of Los Alamos, is overseeing the bomb's assembly. Six years of hard work on the Manhattan Project are about to pay off, but Oppenheimer can't help but feel a subtle, encroaching sense of dread in the back of his mind. Perhaps it's fear over what he and his fellow scientists are about to unleash upon the world, or perhaps it was something else, something worse. The assembly was finished that afternoon. As the scientists celebrated and prepared to move the bomb to the testing site, Oppenheimer approaches the device to get a closer look at their work, bumping into another scientist walking away from the device. One with an expressionless face, blonde hair, and blue eyes that didn't glimmer. Oppenheimer places his hand on its surface. He feels a great sense of accomplishment, power, and terror radiating from his creation. Just then, he hears a click from inside the device. For an instant, there is a look of terror on Oppenheimer's face before he Everyone and everything in a 2,000 foot radius is incinerated off the face of the earth. <laughs> News of the disaster in New Mexico is met with great shock, anger, and disappointment by Allied leaders. The premature detonation at Trinity killed nearly all of the staff involved with the Manhattan Project and had undone several years of hard work in an instant. This disaster, however, is covered up by the U.S. government. As far as the general public knew, America didn't even have an atomic bomb project. Though most chalk it up as a freak accident, 
Some in the government and the military suspect sabotage by German spies. Regardless, there was very little the U.S. could do now to stop the Axis advance. July 27th, 1945, 3 a.m. local time. In the city of Milton Keynes in England, at the Bletchley Park Country House, the Center for Allied Code Breaking Operations, Alan Turing is working by himself late into the night to decipher several German messages recently recovered by British commandos during a covert raid in Berlin. More specifically, it was a raid on the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Physics. Turing had an important assignment to determine how the Axis were able to construct 18 functioning atomic bombs without Allied espionage finding out about it, how the Germans and Japanese were able to coordinate the dropping of those 18 atomic bombs at the exact same time, or how they were able to deliver their payload without their planes being detected by Allied radar. This tremendous feat the Axis managed to pull off was puzzling. While it was suspected by Allied command that Germany had an atomic bomb project that made some progress, it was inconceivable that Japan's nuclear weapons program made any progress at all, much less both countries managing to successfully create several nuclear weapons at the same time, just when victory for the Allies was so close. Even less so as to why exactly no more atomic bombs had been constructed or used since the initial attack four and a half months ago. It was the weight of this great mystery that motivated Turin to work as hard as he did. Eventually, Turin reached a letter in the pile dated January 1945. As Turin deciphers its contents, he learned that it was written by German theoretical physicist Werner Heisenberg, and the letter was meant for, but never sent to, none other than the Fuhrer himself. The letter had been written shortly before Heisenberg and his staff had been moved from Kaiser Wilhelm Institute to work in facilities in southern Germany. What Heisenberg had written was a detailed summary of Germany's many efforts to construct an atomic weapon and their failures. That the prospect of Germany succeeding in such an effort at that point in the war was impossible, and that Japan's nuclear weapons program was even more hopeless. Turing can't believe what he is reading. Just two months before the Axis's devastating nuclear attack on the free world, one of their own top physicists had deemed the notion of constructing a single bomb as infeasible. This revelation only gives Turin more questions than answers, but now he is certain of one thing, that something else is going on here. Something far larger than anyone could imagine. Something that single-handedly turned the tide of the war overnight. As to what that something is, Turin has no idea. All he knows is that he must get this information to his superiors as soon as possible. He grabs the letter and begins to leave his office. He turns to look out a window and into the starry night sky. For just a moment, he wonders if the Nazis had outside help. Just then, the power goes out. Turin stumbles through the darkness in search of either a light source or an exit. Suddenly, he hears a loud thud on the ceiling above. With his eyes adjusted to the dark, Turin moves quickly to the nearest exit, racing down a flight of stairs. Just then, the ground below starts to tremble that causes Turin to tumble and fall the rest of the way down. The trembling abruptly ceases. Turin is mostly unharmed and gets back on his feet. The front door is in sight. He runs for it. It's almost over. Turin hears a single loud footstep right behind him. Before he can even turn to see what it is, his head is grabbed by an unseen force and his neck is snapped. The following morning, Bletchley Park would be found burned to the ground, with the corpse of Alan Turin and all of his work incinerated with it. September 1945. With the end of summer comes the end of the Western Front, as the Allies are once again forced to abandon France to Nazi occupation and Italy is reunited under a German puppet state. The Soviets have fared slightly better than their Western counterparts, as the German advance has stalled in Riga, Smolensk, and Kiev. Japan, meanwhile, has reasserted control of the East Indies, the Mariana Islands, and the Caroline Islands. Only the Philippines remains firmly in Allied hands. One of the few surviving American generals, George S. Patton, is very displeased with these developments. From his point of view, he sees the current presidential administration as inept, completely bungling the war effort. Furthermore, he perceives the Soviets as another enemy to the United States that Roosevelt and Truman were wrong to make an ally of. And should the Soviets turn the tide on the Eastern Front, they could conquer the whole of continental Europe 
and potentially set their sights on America. Believing he could do better than the elected officials, General Patton concocts a devious plot. Upon his return to the United States from Europe, he finds a group of like-minded military officers such as Richard K. Sutherland and spends the next three months planning and preparing to oust the government. On December 6, 1945, the military surrounds key government buildings in Washington, D.C. The Capitol Building, the Supreme Court, and the White House. Representatives, senators, justices are placed under arrest as well as President Truman who is shortly executed by Patton's followers for alleged crimes against the Republic. Truman would be executed by firing squad. Thirteen shots were fired before he died. The first twelve were delivered by a line of a dozen infantrymen, before the coup de grace was delivered by Patton himself. The United States Constitution is suspended and martial law is declared all across the country. In a radio broadcast delivered to the nation days later, General Patton proclaims he had saved America from a cabal of cowards and communists, and that he will now restore order to the rest of the world by defeating the Axis, promising to end martial law and to have new elections as soon as the war is over. Patton elaborates that the war can only truly be over once every threat to the American way of life is destroyed. He ends his speech by unilaterally declaring war on the Soviet Union. The reception to Patton's speech domestically and abroad is not positive. Protests and insurgencies break out across the U.S., which are quickly and brutally suppressed by the Army and the National Guard. Minority groups suffer the worst atrocities inflicted by Patton's regime. In the USSR, General Secretary Beria is beyond enraged by America's betrayal. He cuts all diplomatic ties with the Western powers and begins peace talks with Germany. The British government under Prime Minister Eden chooses to stand by the new American regime for the sake of solidarity against German fascism and now Russian Bolshevism. March 1946. The Nazis and the Soviets settle on an armistice. The new border between the Third Reich and the Soviet Union splits through the Baltics, Belarus, and Ukraine. With the world's armies battered from several years of fighting, engagement between Allied and Axis forces becomes less frequent, and fewer breakthroughs are made on the front in the second half of the 1940s. The Nazis, despite all their recent success, are still unable to cross the English Channel, and have instead returned to bombing civilian targets in a second blitz. German diplomatic efforts to drag Spain into the war finally succeed, allowing the Axis to invade Portugal capture Gibraltar, and reopen the North African front. Following Patton's declaration of war on the USSR, the US Navy gets into skirmishes with the Soviet Navy in the Arctic and the North Pacific. In the summer, the US invades Chukotka and Far Eastern Siberia. However, this invasion achieves little, and this front turns into a stalemate for years. The most success seen by any nation at this point in the war is Japan. In 1948, they finally succeed in pacifying China and begin to utilize its resources to resupply their military. They renew their invasion into Burma and even begin drafting plans for an invasion of Australia. After the war reaches its 10-year anniversary, an anti-war movement arises to try to petition their governments in several allied countries to try to end the bloodshed. But just like the United States, these protests are brutally repressed by their governments with the help of the US military. The basic human rights we take for granted the most the right to petition, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, and the right to self-defense all disappear overnight, and those rights are only the first ones to go. The early 1950s sees astounding technological breakthroughs by all sides. Helicopters, faster jets, long-range missiles, satellites, more advanced computers, and piloted mechs. Patton and Hitler, growing older and their health deteriorating, become more reliant on the latest medical technology to keep themselves alive. Prime Minister Koiso undergoes an experimental procedure to save his life from esophageal cancer. In 1953, Allied intelligence hears word of a secret meeting between all Japanese military leaders and pro-war politicians, including Koiso, later in the fall at a castle built during Japan's War and States period in the Nagano Prefecture. While the nature of the meeting itself is unknown, the American military sees a new opportunity. 
If a group of elite commandos could be pair-dropped outside of the castle on the night in question, infiltrate it, and eliminate all the attendants, Japan will suffer a great morale blow. The pro-peace faction will be left in charge of the government and would be willing to sign a peace treaty. Allied Command knows exactly who they need to assign to lead this mission. A man who after many years had proven himself to be ruthless and a capable leader. A man who started out as a lieutenant in the Navy when the war began and had risen through the ranks to become the captain of an airborne special operations unit known as the Fallen Angels. After their formation in 1947, the Fallen Angels had successfully pulled off several acts of sabotage and assassination behind enemy lines, often without even suffering a single casualty. There is not a single doubt in the minds of the commanders that the man who had led the Fallen Angels since its inception, Captain John F. Kennedy, will effortlessly eliminate Japan's military leaders and end the war in the Pacific. November 22nd, 1953. 12.15 a.m. local time. Under the cover of darkness, the Douglas C-47 plane approaches its target. Captain Kennedy, in his mechanized exosuit, is the first to jump out, followed by the rest of his team. The fallen angels land by the road leading to the fortress. Kennedy relays the plan to the rest of the team. Sergeants Hill and Connolly will stay behind and watch the road for any approaching Japanese reinforcements and to make sure none of the targets escape. The captain will lead the others into the castle, proceeding with stealth, quietly eliminating any guards until they find the room where the meeting is being held, kill everyone inside, then clear the rest of the castle of any possible survivors, as not a single target can be permitted to live. They would then regroup with Hill and Connolly, exfiltrate to the area eastward on foot, and eventually arrive at the coast where they will be discreetly rescued by a small submarine. After explaining the plan, Captain Kennedy takes one last puff from a cigar and gives some words of encouragement. Do not pray for easy lives, my friends. Pray to be stronger men. He puts out his cigar and unholsters his machine gun, leading the men to the north wall of the fortress. The fallen angels climb up the wall. Kennedy peeks to see if there are any guards in view, and they drop onto the other side in a courtyard. The sound of their feet crunching snow upon impact alerts a Japanese soldier inside a nearby tower. He emerges from the base of the tower to investigate, but is barely two steps out of the door when he is grabbed by Kennedy, who slits his throat. Kennedy's hand covers the Japanese soldier's mouth to prevent the gurgling sound from attracting more attention. To be sure no one investigates the disappearance of the soldier, the men equip silencers on their pistols and enter the tower one by one, quietly eliminating everyone inside. After exiting the tower, the fallen angels approach the main structure of the castle, ready to go down in history as the men who ended the war. Minutes later, half a mile away, Sergeants Hill and Connolly are still waiting by the road, ready to ambush any incoming or outgoing vehicles. Suddenly, they hear the sound of machine gun fire coming from inside the castle. Sergeant Connolly remarks with a chuckle that they just became national heroes. Sergeant Hill smiles and nods in agreement, then pulls out a pair of binoculars to get a better look. The gunfire grows less frequent, and after a minute, Hill immediately sees Kennedy emerge from the top of the east wall, but only Kennedy. Hill sees him leap to the ground without looking, making a mad dash away from the castle. He finally notices the look of pure, unadulterated terror on Kennedy's face, covered in tears and blood. Sergeant Hill can't believe what he's seeing. Sergeant Connolly, seeing Hill's stunned expression, also realizes something has gone terribly wrong. The two sergeants instinctively rush to their distressed captain, but Kennedy flails his arms at them, telling them to get away from the castle, yelling through his tears. The sergeants refuse to abandon their captain. They get a hold of him and run for cover in the forest. They find a dense spot in the woods to hide. Hill grabs Kennedy by the shoulders and calms him down. He asks, What the hell happened in there? Where are the others? Kennedy gives a stuttering reply. G gone. Th they're gone. What? How is that possible? L look, you gotta believe me, Sergeant. But they're- <laughs> Kennedy's brain matter splatters over Hill's face. The bullet that came from the direction of the castle ricochets into the right side of Connolly's chest. The frightened Hill drops the captain's corpse, and he flees out of sight of the castle, followed by the wounded Connolly. After two solid minutes of running, Connolly stops and says he can't run anymore, so he falls to his knees. Hill goes back for Connolly to try to get him back on his feet. 
He's already lost a lot of blood, leaving a convenient trail for any pursuers to follow. They can hear the sound of dogs barking and men shouting in Japanese in the distance, growing louder. Connolly, accepting his fate, grabs his gun and tells Hill to save himself. Hill hesitantly sprints away as fast as he can. He can hear the sound of gunfire behind him. He will never forget his fallen comrade's noble sacrifice. After two days of running and hiding, Hill reaches the extraction point where a submarine had been waiting for him. Hill is taken in for debriefing, put in the unenviable position of explaining to the higher-ups just how badly the mission went, how the rest of his team is dead. When Hill gets to the part where Captain Kennedy died, he finally has a moment to truly reflect on it. That when the shot was fired, not only was the castle a half mile away, there was a big tree directly behind Kennedy, between him and the castle. He mentions this to his superiors, that the shot that killed Kennedy and wounded Sergeant Connolly was impossible, as if it had been some sort of magic bullet. His handlers deem him insane. Hill is detained and later taken back to the States, where he will live out the rest of his life in an asylum. Not even a week after Hill's debriefing, Japanese radios broadcast that their pro-peace leaders were found guilty of treason and summarily executed. The opportunity is lost forever. And so, we conclude the first act in our story. So much death and destruction, and so little to show for it. I sure do wonder how this war is going to end. Will the Allies finally gain the upper hand and crush the Axis and finally finish the job they were supposed to do back in 1945? Or will the Axis finally have all the time they need to take over the world? Though I'm sure the question all of you at home are wondering, what exactly is it that caused history to change in the first place? Quite understandable. While I cannot give away that information just yet, I have decided to give you all a small hint. Something that can change history in such a way to cause 18 nukes to rain down on the Allies on one fateful day certainly sounds like quite the implausibility. In fact, one may even call it the mother of all implausibilities. Until we meet again, remember to like, share, subscribe, follow me on Instagram and Twitter. This has been RGM3, Alternate Historian. Have a nice day.